Well, welcome everybody. We're going to ask the question, who was Japheth, generation 11 of mankind? Let's use the periodic table of history to answer that question. We have a graph here with 6,000 years of history on the y-axis, and then we have the equator on the x-axis. I'm right over here in the United States, 2020. What we'll do is come over to Israel and then go back in time to the time of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We can see Noah right here lived 950 years. He lived through the old world when the great flood happened, and he lived into the beginning of the new world. Three of his sons were Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and we know the dates when Shem lived, 2560 B.C. to 1958 B.C. Then Japheth's life is extrapolated from Shem. And what a lifespan, because he could have lived over here to the, the time of Abraham, Isaac, and, and Jacob, because we can see Jacob right here. This point right here is how long Shem lived. Japheth is given credit for creating the European nations. And we can see some genealogies over here, some from Babyloniaca, also the Hebrew histories. There are some flood legends that come from Ireland, Wales, and even Scandinavia. And we can look at some of these life bars over here are the genealogies of Japheth's line. So Japheth lived through the flood to see the start of the post-flood civilization. And Japheth and his wife were one of the four most prominent couples in the world before 2000 BC. He had all the access to the technology of the pre-flood world. And have you ever wondered how Japheth and his children spread out into the world? Well, I have, and that's what we're going to look into now, when he lived and how he spread out into the world. In Genesis 6, 9 and 10, says, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You can read about the great flood of Noah in many cultures. Ovid writes a flood story called Metamorphosis. It's written of the Greek flood account. Uh, the Greek high god Zeus created a flood on earth, and one man named Deucalion and his wife are saved in a wooden chest. There's a Norse set of poems called Poetic Edda, and Burgelmere is the survivor of the Great Flood. In Ireland, La Borga Bala Erin, this flood story speaks of Noah's granddaughter discovering and moving to Ireland. Then in successive waves of immigration, the children of Magog land on Ireland. And it's fun to look at this story and think about the time period and geography 2500 to 2000 BC, and that's what we're going to be doing. Um, in Wales, we have Dwyfin and Dwyfik, uh, one of my favorite titles. It sounds very Welsh. The man and woman survived a great flood by getting into a boat. Well, out of all these flood legends, uh, the Genesis account reads like a ship log. In other words, the Genesis account reads like an actual document that a captain would keep. And so it goes that Noah was 600 years, 2 months, and 17 days old when the flood starts. After 40 days, 40 nights, there is a continual rain, 150 days of water prevailing. In Genesis 8, 4, it states, The ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. And after 40 days, Noah opened the ark window, sent out a raven and a dove. There are seven more days, so let the dove out again. Seven more days, Noah sent out the dove a third time, and it didn't come back. And then in Genesis 8.13, it states, And it came to pass in the 600th and first year, in the first month, the first day of the month, the waters were dried up from off the earth. And Noah removed the covering of the ark and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried. The specificity of this is quite good. So we'll zoom in here and look at the landing site of Noah. As a hiker, I'm just blown away by the geography and the topography.
There's Mount Ararat, and it might be one of the hangout places for Noah. In the initial stages of civilization, all four couples are trapped together in the ark. Now the first red circle you see here is a hundred mile radius around Mount Ararat, and then the other circle is a 200 mile radius around Mount Ararat. The reason I mentioned this is I think it's a good metric because I know as a hiker the most I've ever hiked is 30 miles in one day through very rough terrain, 8,000 feet of elevation gain and, and 30 miles. And so I think Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and all their wives were way more fit than I am. Much better genetics, much more experience, so on and so forth. And so they would have been able to cope with this a hundred times better than I can. But just to give you some perspective on this, remember this is a hundred mile radius and then a 200 mile radius. So they would have been stuck to this area right in here. And I think it's fun to uh, look at what they they would have done right off the bat because I would be interested in where I would get fresh water, how I could survive to the best of my abilities. And I see two lakes. We talked about Shem already, that we could come down here to this lake, and this links up into the Tigris and Euphrates. So that's a, a major pathway, Lake Van. And then if we go to Seven Lake, that's the other major pathway. So we see that based upon the descendants of Shem and Japheth, Japheth took the northern and more western route, and Shem took the Lake Van route, and then went more along the Mesopotamian area to the Persian Gulf, and then around to, to where modern-day Jerusalem is making an arc through the Fertile Crescent. Well, we're going to be looking at Japheth, so when, when I theorize where he went and I look at the topography here, uh, there, it's just amazing to, to look around. I see a couple pathways where I might be able to get to this lake back here, and one is right through the mountains here, come down off the arc and around here, and one is come down into this same basin, but go up this direction. And that would get me into this lake. Uh, any fresh water would be imperatively important. And so I could look two different directions and I see the Caspian Sea, but I also can look the other direction and I see the Black Sea much more inviting prospect because I can see rivers that go out through this region and it would be easy to get to this point in these lakes. Once I got to those points I could come up through these crevices in the mountains, river systems, and get over into this area. Now we'd be looking at the Black Sea. So as I alluded to, I, I want to I would be really worried about my survival, and I'd also want to be able to expand, look at the new world, look at what's going on, just like bees when they're, they're leaving their hive. They make small circles at first, then bigger circles, and then bigger circles as they know more and more of their surroundings. Well, we're the same way. I've traveled quite a lot on six continents, and so my main focus is how can I survive, how can I explore, and then can I get back to Mount Ararat where the Ark is, because that's what I know is common. And I can see along the Black Sea that if we get real close up here and look out, we can still see Mount Ararat in the background. Isn't that fabulous? Even if we were down in this river system, we could get up onto the top of these mountains and we could look out there and see Mount Ararat. So it would be very easy also to, to follow these river systems back because you can see these two major river systems are going into the, the Black Sea there. Probably something that fueled a flood over in this region, a Black Sea flood. 
uh, but that would come later after many seasons of the mountains and the rivers draining off into this area that there might be a flood over in the area of Greece. But, but I find this terrain extraordinarily fascinating. And then I want to know where did where did Japheth's sons end up? Now in Josephus, we can get a 2,000-year-old map of where the children of Japheth ended up. It states, Now they were the grandchildren of Noah, in honor of whom names were imposed on the nations by those that first seized upon them. Japheth, the son of Noah, had seven sons. They inhabited so that the beginning of the mountains, Taurus and Aminus. They proceeded along Asia as far as the river Tanis, Tanis or Don River, and along Europe to Cadiz, Spain, and settling themselves on the lands which they light upon, which none had inhabited before. They called the nations by their own names. For Gomer founded those whom the Greeks now call Galatians or Gauls, but were then called Gomerites. Magog founded those that were from him named Magogites, but who are called by Greeks Scythians. Now as to Javan and Mede, the sons of Japheth, from Mede came the Medeans, who are called Medes by the Greeks. Now this is real interesting because out of Sun 1, 2, and 3, we can see that a triangle has formed. So out of the area that, that we have explored together, you can see that right in here in the Black Sea, this would be one of the major stomping grounds. And then uh, first pick of the suns is up here in present-day Ukraine. And then second pick is Magog. And then third pick is down here at the Caspian Sea, the entryway to the Silk Road. So it's interesting to speculate, and I do speculate, that Japheth found his way exploring this area. And we can see very big river systems that would be great to set up shop at over here. The, the river that feeds into the Caspian Sea and also what goes through modern-day Ukraine and into the Black Sea. We can also get back to our primary point of origin, which is the mountain of Ararat, or the as Genesis says, the ark rested on the mountains of Ararat. For my survival, I'd always want to be able to know that I can get back to that point. So this is where the first three sons settled, and we can see a stomping ground pattern in this, which I think would be very fruitful. This should be a, a very good place to explore and be able to draw resources from. Now, if we go on in Josephus, we end up talking about the fourth son. The fourth son is Javan. And so Josephus continues, But from Javan, Ionia, and all the Grecians are derived. Thabal founded the Thabalites, who are now called Ibers, And in the Bible, that name is Tubal. And the Masoshini were founded by Masesh. Now they are Cappadocians. Now that's Meshech in the Bible. There is also a mark of their ancient denomination still to be shown, for there is even now among the city called Mazaka, which may inform those that are able to understand that so was the entire nation once called Tyrus, also called those whom he ruled over Tyrasians. But the Greeks changed the name into Thracians. And so many were the countries that had the children of Japheth for their inhabitants. So we can see that this is where Japheth set up shop to the best of our accounting. We can link the Bible names to the Josephus names, which are almost the same. And then he gives us the Greek names, which becomes the intermediate piece that we need so that we can get our, our modern names together, like Greeks, like France like Scandinavians. 
So we can see a couple different stomping circles that Japheth would have gone on. One is over here between the Black Sea, Caspian Sea, and back to Southern Caspian Sea and to Mount Ararat. And then the other stomping ground, if you look at this and the way the suns are set up, we have the Greeks for Tubal 5, Meshach 6, and then Tyrus 7. Like they just went in a circle around the Black Sea and each one of the suns chopped up a piece of the land around the Black Sea. So all of this is just absolutely incredible to me when I think about trying to find where we came from. And then when I realize that we actually have a record of where we came from, I'm overjoyed. Of course, I have to neglect the evolutionary record completely, but in my view, the evolutionary record is just a fabrication anyway. Uh, it's a modern myth made by the English, and it spread very quickly because of the English language being the language of business. But keep in mind, evolutionism is just another religion. It's never been proven, and what it did was put a wedge between history and science. And I think both of them can go together, but the evolutionists think that science is the only thing there is. Now, I don't like to get into assumptive science, and I know that evolutionism has a great amount of assumptions. It rests on all of its assumptions, and all of its assumptions are guesses. So I pay no heed to evolutionism, and then I look at this record and how logical it is, and I ask myself, is that believable? Is it believable that somebody could get off of the ark and then would they be exploring for the next few hundred years would their sons set up like this? And the answer to that is yes, it's extraordinarily logical, and it's extraordinary to look at the geographical features and even the names of these countries today. Some people study the language groups, and they've come up with Indo-European, and this is fabulous because if we look at the sons of Shem, we find that there is Elam, who settled in Iran, and then we have Mede, who's the father of the Medes. Now, this is the basis of the Silk Road, and so whoever controls this area controls the Silk Road. So there's a big shootout between Elam and, or we could say, Persia and the Medes. And the name of this area today is Iran. See, Aryan is just a corruption of Iran, and it's all part of this Indo-European language group because of the way the children settled out. The Shemitic people that went out to the east ended up in India. So we have Indo-European language group and then you also see this whole area where the supposed Neanderthals came from, which in the creation record seem to be people who have lived very long lifespans. So this point of information is consistent with the Hebrew record. And then we see all these sons of Japheth and these sons of, of Shem having to form alliances. So it just fires me up to see history when you place a certain people group in time and you get the geography and you start looking logically at its feasibility. I get more ecstatic about the Hebrew record. When we look at the Japheth type histories, we see the, the Medes are integrated into Babylon and Acadia very well. So they're about right here. And then we can go on and look at the most ancient of the Japhethitic or European type kind of histories. And we see Greece here and then Ireland. We can go farther. We can see that England is here, but that integrates into Ireland as more and more people groups are migrating around. We can see uh, Rome is not founded at about 1000 BC, but we can see people groups in Rome around 1000 BC. And then also we can go to uh, Spain is here. They're one of the players. And the Scandinavians. 
There are Gothic people right here that later turn into Romania. And then France is about right here, but it doesn't get its name until later. So we, when we look into time, we can see the most prominent kingdoms putting a mask over the modern era and then going back in time, going back in time to where Celtica, Ireland was, and then Greece, and then the Medes. These were the most prominent kingdoms. When we integrate that idea with, with our display of where the sun settled, we can see that Medes are making arrangements with Elam, forming Iran, or the Aryans. And we can take these suns one at a time and look at the geographic features which would have influenced them. See, I can see Goma right here, the, the firstborn son of Japheth. Uh, two of the most prominent features that I see are this river that goes up into Kiev, and then also the mountain range. If you were in this area, and you were trying to get away from some threat, and you had to flee, see, you would have to flee in this direction. So the mountain range and the river systems would guide you. So if we just use logic, you can see the, the best direction to go is up here. And so we can logically sequence that. And it's so fun to think about this because we can start with where Gomer is and follow the rivers and the mountain systems. And one prominent way to go is going to be out this way, which ends up being the land of Gaul and Celtica in this area, which when we look at the periodic table of history, now we can see that there are people in this region at this time. So that happens to be a, a very probable pathway that the Gomerites would have taken and then we call them later Gauls, the Romans called them Gauls, and then we now call them, them France. And that's one spike, I'm not saying the, the Irish people are from Gomer, but I'm saying that is a migratory path that is very highly probable. Now if we take the second son, Magog, we'll look at the river systems that Magog has access to, keeping in mind that going up this river system goes right past Moscow and takes us up here into the Scandinavian lands. We learned before that the Irish myths talk about the Magogites visiting them multiple times. And you can see how easy it would be for them to continue their journey over here. We've talked about the Medes before, but this is just fascinating to think about the paths that the Medes would have gone on. They have the easiest access to this area around Mount Ararat, they can also easily access this full area around the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. If you think about history as it's extrapolated further, this is on the Silk Road, so the Medes would have had the ideal position to explore to the east along the Silk Road, and also may even be people that explored into this other region, like getting into Korea or coming up here even into the Americas. They probably would be helped by Magog or the Scandinavians or Scythians. But we do see the beginnings of the Silk Road even there. If we go to the fourth sun, we've got Javan. What does he have access to? Well, if we think about him expanding out, geographically, one of the easiest ways for him to go is going to be along the shores of the Mediterranean 
and thus to Rome. Now, Tubal is called the Iberians later, and what I find fascinating about that is there's another place, it's the Iberian Peninsula, which is Spain. Since one of the later descendants of the Japhethites forms Tarsus, I think after many conquests, it's likely that Tubal would have had access to the Silk Road out to Tarsus, and then the Mediterranean Sea also used to be called the Sea of Tarsus. So this could be the start of one of the greater sea powers of the early world. Now Meshach had access to northern Turkey, which is where the Cappadocians are known for, and then also up into the area of Gomer and Magog. One thought is Meshek is an earlier rendition of Moscow. If we think of the early migration paths of Meshek, we would be thinking of this route through Cappadocia, and then we could follow these river systems ever which way, but end up up here in Moscow. The seventh son of Japheth is Tyrus, the Thracians, or Taurus. And he was known to be a great pirate and sea marauder. And even Atlantis could be out here as a crash site of the Black Sea flood. Tyrus may have been broken up quite a bit over that. And if we look at him from a, a land strategic area, it's very easy to avoid these mountains and then get into this region, which is in Central Europe or may have been a precursor to the Germans. So we can see that even though we only know a little bit about these people, if we think logically about the time, about the expansion that would have been going on, and about the geographical features and how they would have had to survive on the river systems, I'm very excited about this model, and I think it has great credence. And when we go back to the periodic table of history, we can see that in this time period, we're extrapolating Japheth from Shem, and Shem outlived people all the way out even to a little past 2000 BC. So the lifespans are phenomenal. We can take a look at this graph of the decreasing lifespans after the flood. I think a similar phenomenon would have happened for Japheth. And then there are myths about people living long ages, even in the Greek myths. We have Greek and Celtic genealogies that link the people of this era to Japheth and then to Noah. And then if we go back to the thoughts of the Greeks, they thought these guys hung out on Mount Olympus. From my perspective, it's highly likely that this was a meeting point for Shemham and Japheth. Because the only thing you can go on are the landmarks. And if this is the central area where Japheth hung out at, you'd still want to be able to get back to Mount Ararat. If all of his children are all around Mount Olympus, and he could easily find his way back to Mount Ararat using this route. Now I have the greatest respect for the Hebrew history because it follows like a historical document or a scientific document more than any of the other histories in the ancient world. Uh, I see uh, Greek myths uh, laden with exaggerations and uh, things that I have a hard time with. I think if we extrapolate some ideas from what they were remembering, we can get an interesting picture of the world of Noah and Shem, Ham, and Japheth and how 
history developed? And I think this answers one of the most fascinating questions in the world, which is, where did we come from? So when you get some free time, please read Genesis chapter 7 to 10. And now we can see with all of this history that we can see the genealogy of Adam connects to the genealogy of Japheth, which connects through various documents into the genealogies of the Celts, Irish, Greeks, and the Medes. Well, thanks for watching. It's always free to subscribe, share, thumbs up, and comment. Have a great week, and I will see you in the next video.